Thank you all for uh, joining this session. Uh, the title of the session is Building a Production Great Document Understanding System with LLMs. And um, my name is Ville Tulos. I'm a CEO co-founder here at Outer Bounds. And uh, Eddie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Eddie Matea. I am a data scientist at Outer Bounds. Awesome, awesome. And uh, some of you uh, may know us uh, like from the Metaflow community. So. Um, I used to be leading uh, machine learning and AI infrastructure at Netflix before, like where we studied Metaflow, open source Metaflow project. Of course, like before the AI boom, and uh, now, of course, like kind of uh, expanding the, the offering to cover like all the good stuff, like with Gen AI, LLMs in particular. So that's like what the session is um, today about. And um, by the way, like um, as the same thing as with the other sessions that you may have been attending earlier today, there's a QA function. Uh, in, in like Google Meet here. So you can find it in the lower right corner, I believe. Like there's the kind of the, the circle and the um, triangle and then a square. You click that and there's QA and uh, you can ask questions there. We also have a dedicated Slack channel uh, for this workshop. I will be sharing the details soon. So you can also ask questions there, not only like during the workshop, but um, the after the workshop as well. So the idea is, of course, that uh, everything that like we will be presenting here today is something that like you can apply at home and like you can do in your own environment. So hopefully you will find it very useful. So um, um, now that I think like we have we have like a good number of people who are already here. So I wanted to start by kind of just framing uh, what we will be talking about today. So since the title of this uh, workshop is building a production grade document understanding system with LLMs, I think that like we can uh, kind of unpack all the four phrases here in this long title. And uh, the, the first thing um, to unpack here um, is like what we mean by document understanding. So um, now, of course, like all of you, I'm, I'm sure that like you are very familiar with uh, all the chat GPTs and like different chat interfaces uh, to LLMs and like all the amazing things you can do. But uh, specifically, the use cases that we are interested in and we will be covering in this session are these cases that I'm, I'm, I'm sure that like most of you have in, in at your companies, where you have some kind of a repository, some kind of a corpus of of unstructured data, specifically uh, natural language, which may be let's say customer support chats, could be product reviews, could be medical records, could be uh, insurance claims, movie screenplays, like used to be one one data source at Netflix. And or it could be any any other kind of like um, a corpus of, of text that you have access to. And now there are, of course, like many, many different um, real life use cases, what one might want to do with, with text like this. You may want to summarize these documents. You may want to classify them. You may want to analyze the sentiment. You may want to re-rank them. There are all kinds of things. And, uh, and now, of course, like the, the really the interesting fact here is that um, previously, before large language models, of course, there was the whole and like, of course, still is the whole subfield of natural language processing uh, dedicated in, in studying like these different tasks, like a, like a natural language summarization and classification and so forth. And like it kind of like a, it was definitely like something that required like a sophisticated methods. And like even even with those, I mean, the, the results were at times a bit questionable. But now the absolutely amazing things uh, thing about the LLMs is that like many of many of these use cases have become much more accessible and like a much uh, like a much more like kind of um, um, that like you can op obtain a much higher quality than than ever before like just by like putting like a few models together and now of course the other part here is really about the LLMs and like really the the, the one of the most exciting things about the the LLM uh, revolution that's going on is that it's not only uh, the kind of let's say the open ai api that you can use to build systems like this but there are many many and like an increasing number of open source llms and of course like many commercial providers as well that uh, provide different large language models and I, i'm sure that like many of you who have been following the industry for the past one and a half years you know that there's just like a constant competition that like which one of these models uh, performs the best and and depending like on the evaluation, depending on the on the data set, depending like on, on many, many different variables, I mean, like you may get different results. And it's not obvious like kind of a, if, if like if for all tasks, there's like one model that always performs better than the others. So uh, now that being said, uh, this session is actually not so much about going into details about different LLMs or like even evaluating different LLMs and, and, and so forth. So we are much more focused on really the kind of the, the, the other like a phrase here, which is the kind of the production create systems. So now assuming that 
that you have access to these LLMs. And we will definitely talk about like how you can access these LLMs. The question is that like, how do you actually like put all these pieces together and like connect the pipes here as in this picture? And then of course, like we fully expect that the, the LLM landscape will keep evolving. And actually I would say that like one of the key features of, of these production grade LLM systems today uh, needs to be the fact that that the landscape uh, will keep changing and moving and like of course like you can't assume that like you just pick an off-the-shelf model today like let's say llama 3 or like even using the, the whatever latest gpt 4.0 and like you will keep using that for the next five years i mean that is of course not realistic but rather you should design your systems with the mindset that like there will be new llms coming in and like you want to constantly iterate and like you will want to kind of maintain the freedom to test different approaches different prompts different llms so i i think that that that's like really like a fundamental feature of, of any like a production grade uh, system using llms as of today now um another thing like kind of looking at the like what we actually mean by a production grade now that's that's kind of like the whole point of of this workshop and like something that we wanted to share with all of you today because realistically there are so many ways how one can um kind of perform these actions using llms today it's very very easy to just hit an open ai api it's very easy to um like even even like kind of use uh, like a different Python frameworks to kind of like put together, like to get get kind of a something done, like build a quick prototype. But then an interesting question, and like we just happen to be working with many companies who are really interested in using um, like, let's say document understanding in really, really business critical use cases. Let's say you have to do the medical record analysis or you have to analyze insurance claims. So then like as always with engineering, there are like additional questions that like you have to answer, like besides the, the question that, okay, I mean, like how do we just like feed the prompt to the LLM and get some responses? And, and here are some examples of the questions that like, for instance, like it's not only a static data set of, 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 of documents, but I mean, like you probably have new documents coming in, maybe in real time, maybe as a continuous stream, like you have to kind of set up a system that can feed these things, uh, like feed the documents continuously to the LLM. Of course, like it's very, very important that um, like you access the documents, especially like thinking about sensitive data sets like medical records that like you, the whole system is set up in a very um, privacy protecting and, and secure manner. And uh, also like it may be the case that like you may have even millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of such documents. And then there's a very like an interesting question that, well, how do you actually like even like use these LLMs at scale? And maybe some of you uh, may have experienced the problem that let's say, you try to uh, crunch through a million document million documents using the open ai apis and you start getting rate limited and and then the question becomes that okay like how do we work around these rate limits or otherwise it will take just way too long to go through a million documents and and remember that like you won't be going over a million documents only once but i mean like maybe you want to change the prompt maybe you want to try a different model and and like it has to be easy enough to do that also, of course, the model evaluation is, is a very much an like, active research topic even. And, uh, and like, we, we don't have time today to go down that rabbit hole, but I mean, the evaluation is probably something that like, you want to keep doing on a continuous basis. And, and again, I mean, like being able to kind of uh, hit these LLMs efficiently becomes a key. And then like, let's say that like, you have managed to build a, a system that like, is performing some business critical action already. Now, what happens like when you have a new version, like what if somebody comes in and uh, says that like, okay, I mean, we can change the prompt or maybe there's a new technique. Obviously, like you can't just replace the, uh, the old production system uh, with the click of a button and like, just like roll it, roll it out something to production, like without proper testing. But the same, same best practices when it comes to rolling out models that, that apply to, to traditional ML, of course, like apply in this world as well, which is to say that, uh, for instance, like you may want, may, you, you may have your challenger model, you may have your challenger prompt, a new version of the prompt that you may want to run uh, against the, the production version, like for a while in kind of like AB experiment manner, run them side by side and compare the results, maybe compare some with KPIs and, and, and see if the new, new approach works better than the old one. And like, these are the type of questions that we want to cover today. And, and like maybe these are the ones that like don't always get so much attention because they're oftentimes more I mean, even infrastructure focused than like the exciting questions about like what's the, the kind of the best performing LLM of today. Now, the, the last part of the title is, is of course, the, the building aspect. So this is not a theoretical workshop. This is a very much a hands-on workshop. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, the context here uh, for those of you who may have joined like after, like we introduced ourselves. So like 
again, I mean, just saying it again, because I know that we have some tens of people um, who joined after the introduction. So my name is Ville Tulos, CEO co-founder here at Outer Bounds. And like Eddie Mattia, it's here like uh, like with me also from Outer Bounds. And uh, like, if you look at the, uh, look at the chart here, you can see that um, like we will be using this open source project called Metaflow, which we started at Netflix many years ago. And uh, Netflix, of course, still runs on Metaflow. Uh, and like the reason why we started this company, Outer Bounds, is that they are exactly all these production concerns that used to happen and, of course, still happen with traditional ML and now also like apply to, uh, to let's say, uh, LLM systems powered by LLMs. And there are like all these questions about like, how do you access data? How do you do compute at scale? How do you orchestrate these systems? How do you version? And like our band really like focuses on providing a platform for those questions so that then you can use uh, the really nice developer friendly APIs provided by Metaflow to build these applications. So that's the idea. So hopefully like by the end of this workshop, like you have an idea how you can utilize Metaflow to build these production grade document understanding systems. Also, like for those of you who may have joined, like after the beginning, like there's the QA uh, mechanism of, of Google uh, Meet. So you can find it in the lower right corner. So there's a QA. So if you have any questions, you can use that. But we also have a dedicated Slack channel. Um, well, I mean, maybe one thing about Metaflow for those of you who may have not heard about it before is that it's actually used quite widely in the industry. Of course, like in addition to Netflix, there are companies like Amazon Prime Video, many companies in the life sciences, financial services, all like across industries. So there's a good chance that like you may find it useful as well. So uh, what we will be doing over over the next, uh, like kind of a little bit more than an hour is that like we will kind of like go uh, like through um, kind of like a typical, like um, I guess like an evolution of, a, of a, like a production grade project, like which starts with a, with a kind of like a nice uh, local prototype. And then we uh, dive into the question that, okay, I mean, like what, what is the next step after like you have a local prototype running? I mean, like, why do we even have to do something beyond, beyond like a nice app that runs locally? And then like lastly, in the end, like we will even talk about like a really kind of a business critical concerns about like, how do you integrate the data warehouses and stuff like that. Now, um, for those of you who may want to actually um, just hack along and uh, follow the examples live, um, like we have actually uh, set up a dedicated uh, Slack channel in the Metaflow community Slack, uh, like where we have instructions how um, you can run the examples. And actually, like what's really fun is that we have um, set up a, our like playground outer bounds instance uh, for all of you for this workshop. So even if you don't have access to any LLMs. Even if you don't have access to any cloud infrastructure, like you can, you can still like uh, uh, follow along uh, just by going to the Slack channel, and like you are able to then use your email to log into the system, and like also as an additional benefit, like you you can kind of see like what we have been working on. So again, um, if you want to hack stuff like as we go, join the Slack uh, like at that address. Like you notice that there's the HTTP, just HTTP, not HTTPS, like for the Slack link, since uh, it, it redirects you to the actual like a Slack invite. And then you can uh, join that workshop doc understanding 2024 channel there. And then we have posted instructions at the top of the channel that you can follow. Also, um, Eddie and myself will be monitoring the channel there as we go. So if you have any questions, so don't hesitate to ask, ask there as well. And um, actually, like, by the way, Eddie, if you are able to, I guess that like, you can like also post the Slack link to the Google chat so folks can click that easily. Yeah, there's yeah, one um, listed in the Q&A, although I'm not sure if people who recently joined can see it. If there's anybody who doesn't see in the Q&A a Slack link and a link to the GitHub, please let us know in the Q&A. <laughs> um, and then we can, uh, we can make sure that everyone can see that. Right. Um, I see there's a couple of folks that joined and I added um, to the deployment um, V list. So um, awesome. if, more, if more trickle in, yeah, we can keep adding them on the, on the playground. Awesome, awesome. So again, I mean, join Slack, um, like you will get access to fun infrastructure, like for the duration of the workshop. And uh, of course the kind of the, um, the repo and like we can share the uh, GitHub repo link for the examples also. So mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't want to sign up right now, I mean, like you can, you can do it at home. Awesome. Cool. So, uh, well, I guess then, like, without.
further ado, like we can um, actually get started. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the first thing we want to show is kind of a like a pretty pretty great um, like a starting point, like um, how you can start building such a system, like by by creating a local prototype. So I will hand it over to Eddie, who can like a show show the kind of uh, the uh, the demo in action. All right. Um, could we go one slide forward, and maybe we can look at the kind of the yeah. small but big enough picture um, to start off here. So. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to kind of go on this trajectory of kind of building a local prototype, um, connecting our Python code that we might write in the Jupyter Notebook when we're experimenting, connecting this into a very basic front end app and more of an API microservices oriented way of writing your Python code. Um, so this is really important in kind of this LLM world where a lot of things that we're dealing with are our API servers. Um, dealing with vendor APIs, hosting our own APIs, things like this. Um, so we'll kind of go through a, a very basic app that shows this. Um, we're we're going to use a Svelte app today, but it could be a Streamlit app, a React app, whatever um, whatever your team is using for um, kind of production user interfaces. Um, and we'll see kind of how to set up, how to set this all up um, from a very high level, how to use it. Um, and then we'll kind of go into the, the details later and kind of understand what motivates the kind of transition that we were talking about when you go from this kind of prototyping mode to now I have a million documents and need to really scale the system up and process all these documents in a batch. Um, how do I do that reliably, effectively at scale? Okay, so let's now. Yeah, we'll stop over. sharing so you can take over. Yeah, I'll take the screen. Yeah, uh, and by the way, like uh, I, I saw the questions that like some of you posted uh, like about like not being able to log in, so like we can look into that. Make sure that you are able to join the Slack. Mm. Uh, that may be, I'm realizing now that I did use the HTTPS in my Slack uh, link, so this may be the culprit. Yeah, OK, so maybe I'll, I'll just post it again. OK, um, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and share, I'll share my whole screen. Apologies for the infinity mirror. OK, so this GitHub repository github.com slash outer bounds slash document processing is where all the code lives that I'm going to go through. Um, there's essentially three sections. We're going to start off in this PDF app, um, which has the a fast API server, a development notebook, which we'll look at briefly. And then the fast API server talks to a front end application um, that we'll be able to play with in our browser to do chat with a PDF. Um, this also has code to then take the same way of kind of chunking up the PDF contents into text and then feeding those to the LLM so the LLM knows about what's in the PDF. It's going to scale up that workflow to process it if you had many, many such documents. Um, and then we'll come back to the slides and get into some of these other workflows later. So that's where we're at right now. Um, again, the, the repo name is outer bounds slash document processing. And without further ado, I'll start uh, going into the code. Um, and I'm not going to be able to see the video, so um, Vila, I guess, um, please interrupt uh, verbally if, if you need um, or if you have any questions. OK, um, so here's the same, the same app. Again, we want to go into this PDF app. And I'll start off in the front end part. Um, if this is the first time that you're coming here, um, you may not have the node modules and everything installed already. So you can, um, with node installed on your computer, um, you can do an npm install, just npm i, um, and that will kind of get all the front end dependencies that you need. And then when you're in development mode, you can um, just do npm run dev or however you you want to get the application running. Um, I'll note quickly that there's also in the PDF app there's also Docker setup. Um, so the front end and the back end components both have a Docker file, and this Docker compose uh, will orchestrate that job. Um, on a single host. So I'm not going to demo that today, but that's kind of the same outcome. <clears throat> Excuse me, is running the two commands that you'll see me do, um, which npm run dev is the first of. So what this is doing is it's going to run the application that we've built here. So I'll go over to the home page. Um, just has a little bit of an explainer and then a link to this same code base. Um, and the first thing that we're going to look at is this single PDF page. So there's two options. You can either give it a URL to a PDF, or you can upload one from your computer. So I will upload this 
paper. Actually, no, I'll upload one from my computer this time. Mix it up. Um, let's find something to do with outer bounds in here. There we go. OK, so now it's going to give me some kind of loading screen on the UI. But what's actually happening on this backend server? Well, nothing right now. So what we'll end up seeing is an error. So this isn't going to work. Um, the thing that we need to do is to come here into this backend server and actually run the API. Um, so this is the fast API part I mentioned earlier. Um, if you're not familiar with fast API, no worries. It just kind of gives you ways to run Python functions and then turn them into an API um, that you can hit over the internet or in, in applications like we're trying to do right now. Um, so the command to run this is going to be in the readme file for the PDF app. All the um, all these sections have their own readme, by the way. Um, so if you ever get stuck or kind of wondering where things are, um, you can always come back here. So I'll go ahead and run that. Um, if you're not familiar with Fast API, the this main part is saying go look in the main.py file, and here we have a route called PDF chat, and that's kind of where if you really want to get into the weeds of what's going on here. Um, all of this code in PDF chat is kind of all the logic that's going to be chunking up the PDFs into text snippets um, and then uh, indexing these with um, LLM embeddings and then ultimately feeding them to ChatGPT or one of these um, inference models like Llama 3 um, that's going to actually generate the response we showed to the end user. Um, okay, so we see the, the Ubicorn. Um, command is um, now running. So we have our fast API server up and running. Um, and now we actually should be able to talk to the PDF. So I guess uh, one quick ch check you can do to make sure this is working, um, if you're following along or doing this after the fact, um, is you can open up to the, the um, IP address and the, the port that is printed out in the terminal. And since we don't have a home route, fast API won't return anything. but Fast API comes with this very handy docs route that sort of just shows you what your API is. Um, so if you're familiar with Postman or many of these other tools that are more oriented towards DevOps engineers, um, Fast API provides a very clean view um, for you to kind of understand the APIs and to start using them. Okay, um, now going back to the app on the same PDF again. And it's just going to do a very simple process of kind of chunking that as part of the fast API routes. Um, so if you want to explore some of this code more, um, I would suggest going to the dev section of PDF app. There's a notebook that kind of unravels all of this, the chat with PDF. Um, oops. This chat with PDF has like basically the same Python business logic as what's inside of the PDF um, backend. So um, yeah, you can you can come here and it'll be a good way to kind of understand what's going on on the server side. Um, so it looks like this is still running. So maybe I'll just skip ahead for now um, because the real punchline I wanted to get to is not really this this chat app. Um, it's kind of this case of all right. So I can do the the LLM chat routine with one. Um, now, how would I actually scale this up and start um, kind of running these workflows when I have a, a long list of, um, of PDFs? So I think before we go there, um, we, we wanted to go back to the slides doing kind of motivate some of the batch workflow cases. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah that sounds good. So I'll take over and uh, let me uh, go back to the slides quickly. And then basically, um, what the uh, edis application was all about is that you can um have this ui uh like that you can run locally and like you and maybe like i don't know like if it like kind of can um, show you like a few examples even later like how you can then how you can then like kind of a basically uh like uh, like ask questions about the pdf so very very simple document understanding use case and uh, and like you can take a look at the code um it's nothing too complicated in a sense that like you can use these off-the-shelf components to uh, like a chunk the PDF, uh, like then like use an open AI API, to then like kind of a basically uh, like ask questions and like kind of embed the PDF in the prompt. So kind of like maybe things that like some of you may have done in the past. So that's a really a nice starting point for like getting a sense, let's say if you have your own data set, that like, um, like how can you actually like kind of design the appropriate prompts to, to kind of like start getting useful results out of your system. 
but now again, I mean, like really the key key idea of this workshop is that like answer this question that okay, I mean, but is it really production grade? And uh, like kind of the desired like a bit of a um, kind of a, like the desired mindset that we would like to have like with these more production oriented systems is that like we have all these pieces in place so that like you can come up with, with new prompts like maybe there's a new model that you want to try like maybe there's a new data source that gets connected or like maybe there's a new piece of business logic that you need to implement as a part of your system so now like whenever like you do any of those things the question then like becomes that okay like how does the new version of the system work so now always then like you want to evaluate the results and like you typically want to evaluate the results offline like before like impacting any users because maybe many of the ideas are actually like not that great so you just like want to kind of do the evaluation first but then like let's say like you are happy with the results uh then really the kind of the recommended pattern is always that like instead of just blindly deploying things in production you can kind of deploy it as an experiment like maybe running side by side with the production version and then like only like when when you are like really confident that like everything seems to be working well then you can really promote it to production and like where the production then like really means that like we have something business critical running without interference like from from any other experiments or like whatever may be happening in your systems so we will later like talk like how you can actually set up such an environment but really the kind of a, before like we getting like before we get into the kind of the really the battle hardened production there's always this question that like how do we can like approve those bad ideas as as quickly as possible and kind of a, like speed up this like a local development loop which especially like with the llms where you have to design the prompts like you have to try different models it's very very important that like you can do it really fast and now again, I mean, like, the, like just by like running like a few queries by hand, uh, like local prototype works really well. Uh, but the kind of, of course, the one of the key challenges is that like, well, let's say that like you are dealing with actual data sets. You may have again, I mean, even millions of documents, and and like using let's say the APIs that uh, Eddie was showing before. Uh, like where you load uh, PDFs one by one, um, then of course, I mean, that doesn't work at scale. So the question, like, let's say, especially like in the context of document understanding becomes that, okay, how do you set up an environment where you can run these evaluations really at scale? And now that the first step that that like is, is really handy in, in a case like this is that like you actually make it a workflow. And that's of course like where Metaflow really uh, comes into picture. And uh, like Eddie can like show the the kind of the PDF part, but I mean maybe before like we jump into the more exciting, more realistic uh, case that analyzes the PDFs, I can like show a very very simple example that you will always you can also like find in the repo. So um, let me actually like see. I think I had the um, the GitHub repo here. So if uh, we go to the document um, understanding document processing case here, so this is the public repo, hopefully you can see it. Um, there's this uh, subdirectory called sentiment review. You can go here and then like you can uh, like find this Metaflow flow called flow.py. I can just like give you a quick idea what happens. Let me open it here in my VS code. So maybe I'd like a bit nicer to show here. Well, I mean, first, I mean, the, the thing to mention here is that it's less than hundred lines of code. So like nothing too complicated. And basically uh, like what we are demonstrating here is that we have a, a really simple, um, I can actually like show you maybe really simple like data set of, of e-commerce reviews. It's actually in the repo as well. You can find this reviews.csv. There's actually like a Kaggle competition like from a few years back called, and actually like, no, it's some like e-commerce something, but I mean, there's this like a women's clothing review data set. This is, this is from, um, and like you can see that like we have these reviews, like where people have left reviews about about different pieces of clothing on an e-commerce site. And now like what we do in our workflow uh, in this case is that like we have a simple prompt, like where we say that uh, answer with one word happy if the sentiment of the following sentence is positive and otherwise answer with one word sad. And now basically what we would like to do in this basic document understanding case is that we want to crunch through all the reviews. And of course, in this case, it's a, a small data set that we use for testing. But of course, like in a realistic case, like you could imagine that you could even have a thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of such reviews that you want to crunch through. So what we do in this case is that like we organize it as a Metaflow flow. I mean, again, I mean, those of you who may not have used Metaflow in the past, like a very simple Python framework, like you can just uh, create a class, derive it from flow spec, and then you use this at a step decorator to define steps of your workflow. We have, I think we have a four steps here. Like we start with the start, we load, load the CSV here, like we include it as a parameter. 
we uh, now in this case, we actually like to split it in different batches. So we are even able to parallelize this processing, which is one big benefit of doing this in a workflow instead of, let's say, notebook. And um, and then like we uh, even like have some um, visualizations that I will show uh, soon. And then like we run the prompt here. Now, uh, again, um, well, for those of you who are like maybe using the Autobounce platform, like I can show you how you can now like run this at home. You can technically like run this um, run this example like also uh, without the other bones, like if you just like uh, change the uh, APIs to use the open AI APIs. And just like I show you here, hopefully um, you are able to access a UI like this. Um, and again, like you can go to Slack. Again, like for those of you who may have a hard time uh, going to Slack, there's the link in the Google Meet. Uh, it's the HTTP, just HTTP, like not S. And um, then you just post that, like let's say in an incognito window, and like you should be able to log in with your email and then join the um, the uh, the channel there. Let me actually like a check, the kind of the name, the workshop uh, Doc Understanding 2024, and you will find the instructions there. And then like we can also add you to the platform, so you are able to log in. This is the URL. And then like here on the platform, um, so we don't have time to go through all the features, but what you can do is that you go to the workspace, local setup, and then like you can, let's say, most likely you want to do it in a new virtual environment in Python, you bit install um, the outer bounds uh, package. And, um, and then like you uh, run this configuration string that is uh, specific to your account. So you basically just copy paste this and you run it here like this. I have an existing configuration, so I don't need to do it again. Uh, and then, then like grant, that grants you access to the platform. And then like if you have checked out the repo, so you can see that I have the flow.py here. So I'll run the, the Metaplot flow exactly as usual. So I should be able to do this. And uh, I can tell a couple of interesting things that happens here. Like first you can see that it actually like it reads the CSV file. But now the cool thing is that like it gives you this uh, URL um, that links to the now the um, the monitoring UI where you are able to see what's going on during this execution. And like for instance, like again, uh, I think I should be able to command click this here, like this. And now, like again, like if we look at the DAG view, like we can see the workflow that we are running. In this case, we have a start step, and now like we are reading the, the reviews, and uh, and then like we parallelize the prompting in this case. And um, and then like we run like a bunch of prompts in parallel, and then like we just like join the results. Now like if we go here, like you can see that now like we have this like a prompting task starting. I think we have a three of them. Let's see here. Like if we click the start step, like we can see that in this data set, like we have only like a 162 reviews, so that this will process pretty quickly. And now um, if we go to this UI, like um, like a nice feature of Metaflow is that you are able to attach these custom visualizations in the in the execution. So for instance, now you can see that like it is starting to process the prompts. They are coming in here. And uh, and they are like a like it's just a few, like a like I think a first hundred characters of each review. You can see that in some cases, like if somebody really wanted this to work, like um, kind of a, I guess uh, in this case, like kind of the, the 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 kind of the opinion is a bit ambiguous. So it's actually like really really amazing how uh, in this case the LLM is even like able to figure out when you have this like a bit of like a mixed messages, like whether the um, the sentiment is positive or, or negative. So it's really nice that you can you can see this here and like you can also like click this um, like different charts of reviews. So now we are processing them in parallel. And uh, in this case, like we went through like about 50 reviews in about 50 seconds. So it took about like one second to process each. But the big benefit is that like we uh, we were able to run all of these in parallel and we can see the results here. Of course, in a realistic case, you would have a much fancier evaluation, but this will do for now. Again, by the way, like if you have a hard time logging into the platform, like or like running the example of anything of that sort, uh, like just post a question on Slack and like we should be able to help you there. So now the interesting question here, like if I just move on, is that um, if you look at that, this example, um, uh, there are a couple of questions that typically happen like in a, when, when using LLMs. Well, I mean, first question is that, let's say that instead of having this uh, public data set of, of, of floating reviews, what if these were medical records? So like what if these were insurance claims or like anything containing private 
uh, like or otherwise uh, sensitive data. So how, how would you actually like kind of create the LLM securely? Now, the other interesting question here is that if you like kind of a really like a pay attention, like what we were doing here, like we were actually like a hitting the LLM, uh, like from multiple uh, tasks simultaneously. And um, in this case, we were actually not using the open AI APIs because likely in a case like this, we would get rate limited by the APIs. The same would apply to many other, I mean, like if not all other like kind of off the shelf APIs that of course, like have to have some reasonable limits, like how many, how many queries you are able to run in parallel. So now, of course, the kind of a one one like approach that like you can always take is that instead of hitting, let's say, the OpenAI APIs, you can use the open source large language models and like the Llama threes, like the Mixtrals, like many many others that are available. Now, like in practice, like one one challenge that uh, like you some of you may have had like already is that of course like in practice taking taking like these open source llms and like let's say setting up um, an inference server that is able to um, then like kind of take the queries and return the responses is somewhat non-trivial i can like for instance like show you those like a pictures like referred to the blog articles that we have published like you can go to outermouse.com slash blog and like we uh with with hamel who has been like very much looking into llms publishing a lot about them like we looked into um different inference solutions like if we scroll down like to the end of the article you can see that uh when it comes to the throughput of different open source models um there's actually like a quite a like a massive difference between different solutions that are available uh for instance like we did a comparison between the basic uh, SageMaker endpoints like using any scale endpoints and this was like a couple of months ago so of course a fast moving field the rankings may have changed but the idea is that now there are all kinds of optimizations that are available and like if for instance, like you take the kind of the state of the art um, NVIDIA Triton inference server and like you apply TensorRT RT and you use it maybe with the uh, or possibly with the VLLM and like you do all the quantization tricks, then like you can really, really like push the throughput so that like you can run uh, like many, many um, kind of queries in parallel and like get the maximum, maximum performance out of these models. Now, a practical challenge with all this is, is though that um, uh, many, many companies who might have use cases for this uh, document understanding uh, might not have like a energy and an interest in like kind of a starting to go into this level of detail in setting up the, the inference stack. So one thing that I, like we wanted to highlight here as well is that there's like this pretty cool new offering that was released by um, NVIDIA a couple of uh, months ago. Actually, like originally they published it in, um, in, uh, in the, at the GTC conference earlier this year. And like we have been working closely with the NVIDIA um, to kind of uh, integrate these uh, NIM inference microservices as a part of the platform. And like what basically NVIDIA did here is that they took many of these off the shelf open source models like the Llama model, like the Mistral model and so forth. And then they applied all of these optimizations. And you can imagine that NVIDIA knows a thing or two about, about GPUs. So they kind of like applied the state of the art optimizations and like package them up with the uh, NVIDIA Triton inference server, like which is pretty much the fastest like you can find today and made them available as images that you can then like deploy in your own environment. And now if you look at the code closely here, like what we have going on in this piece of code, uh, the, the sentiment review is that like we have this at NIM and, and this is exactly the kind of the NIM integration that now we have uh, like as a part of the Outer Bounds platform. But I mean, of course, the NIM by itself is, is a service that like you can you can access if you have a relationship with NVIDIA. And like, for instance, in this case, we were using the uh, the small Llama 3, 8 billion model. And like we say that like when this workflow executes, this workflow needs access to this Llama 3 model. And like hence, like we, we just say here at NIM and then like we say the model name there. And now, um, like when we come to the prompting uh, task here, we are able then to get head handle to uh, basically an open AI compatible uh, uh, Python client that allows us then to create the LLM. So for instance, here, then like we just construct our prompt. I mean, it's very, very simply the kind of this sentence here, like answer with one word happy if the sentiment is positive. And then like we use the uh, typical completion API uh, here, like to basically uh, send the prompt, uh, send the send the prompt to the uh, to the NIM container that runs in our own environment, and then we get the response, and then we show the response, and then we store the response. And uh, and the big benefit of doing this, like going back to the slides, here, 
is that uh, this basically addresses the kind of a two typical constraints that like you have like when you are playing with LLMs when you are like uh, setting up these uh, document understanding systems. First, like since these models now run in your own environment, in your inside your own account, in contrast to let's say hitting an open AI endpoints or like hitting uh, Google's Gemini endpoints or whatever like other endpoints you may be hitting, everything stays uh, within your environment. So you don't have to send data anywhere else which is really nice. And then the amazing, another like absolutely like kind of a, a amazing like feature like that I like the most is the fact that like with all these other APIs, like you have to basically um, pay per token. So you may know that like they actually charge you by the input token, how many words you are pushing through these APIs and how many output tokens you are receiving from these APIs and you have to pay some amount of money. And of course the amount of money is not that huge. And like if your data sets are small, it doesn't make a huge difference. But uh, let's say you are processing millions or like potentially even tens of millions of documents, of course, these costs keep adding up. And especially like it adds like a certain kind of like a pressure, like for not like running many experiments because there might be like a bit of a feeling that like, well, we can't afford like running like a seven different versions of the prompt because then that would sevenfold our expenses. And, and that, of course, I mean, it's not great for experimentation because you are artificially limiting like kind of a, all the all the experiments that you should be running otherwise. So, so anyway, I mean, just wanted to highlight that like kind of having this setup is really, really useful uh, like for building these systems. And I, I can just like, a, uh, if you want to take a look here, overall, like the mindset, uh, like th just thinking like where the world is going overall is that like you can think of this uh, the same way as as like kind of uh, engineers have been thinking about databases for for the longest time for many decades now uh, in the same sense as we have some um like off the shelf uh like really nice um like a hosted managed databases like mongodb in the same sense of course like a chat gpt kind of a continues to be tremendously useful for some use cases. But at the same time, it is really, really convenient that at times, like you can deploy database in your own environment and, and like you can like work with the database, like without any limitations, without any extra cost concerns and so forth. And I, I think that the LLMs in many ways will follow the same patterns that of course, like we will continue having these proprietary endpoints that are like very convenient to use. Also, like we have wrappers over open source models that you can access through, like, let's say, Amazon Bedrock and Hugging Face and so forth. But at times, like, let's say, especially like when you need more scale, like when you are more concerned about the cost, it's super convenient that you can just deploy them in your own environment. And like, you don't also like have to worry too much about the internals because there's a like a trusted kind of a vendor, NVIDIA in this case, who kind of packages everything and optimizes everything for you. So that is that is a really a nice approach that allows you to iterate really quickly and build these systems quite effectively. So um, we uh, like already talked about the LLM part. So maybe this is a good segue for Eddie, uh, if you have the kind of the PDF part working. So maybe we can like kind of a show how that works in practice. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, <clears throat> return to the code. Um, I will stop sharing my side. So if you want to take over. Do you see the VS code now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so now we're back in this PDF app. And we're kind of in this mindset of, okay, we've seen like a, a smaller kind of prototype where I can track individual samples. Now, what if I want to kind of scale up the number of PDFs that I want to process at once? It doesn't even have to be PDFs as we'll see later. And um, we'll kind of move to processing HTML documents. Um, but in this case, how can we kind of scale up the PDF processing using these batch workflows orchestrated by Metaflow? Um, so, on the back end server um, of the PDF app, we actually have some Metaflow code. Um, if you want to try it, if you're feeling adventurous, it is actually wired up to the API endpoint. So you can trigger this workflow to run um, just by calling that fast API um, route. Um, it's in the GitHub repository explaining how this works. Um, but for now, we'll just run the flow directly um, using Metaflow commands. Um, so like, uh, like before in the, in the code sample that Ville showed you, um, you subclass this flow spec object with Metaflow. And then in this case, what we're gonna do is provide a list of URLs to PDFs on the internet. Um, so this list is just gonna look something like this. So we can um, say, I want, I want this document to be called Torch. And this is the paper, I hope if I didn't mess it up. Yes, this is the paper from PyTorch. Um, and then similarly, we have another research paper, right? And we can just extend this list longer and longer. And then the idea is that we're gonna kind of build the same style of RAG pipeline that's gonna also kind of fit the semantic search model that we wanna use at inference time 
to guide the LLM with more factual results, um, more results that are actually understanding how to continue generating text based on content of the page attention paper and the torch paper in this case. Um, so going back to the, the workflow itself, um, the start step, there's not too much interesting happening. We're just kind of making sure that the PDF paths are set up correctly. Um, then in the extract text step, um, you'll notice that probably the most interesting part of the start step is that we run extract text for each of the S3 paths. So this file that we're passing in, each of these is eventually going to be putting this PDF document in um, cloud object storage. Um, and Metaflow makes it very easy to do this in a few lines of code. And then in the extract text step, we're going to be um, running for each of those PDFs a process that gets text chunks and um, these will eventually be what feeds our, our modeling pipeline, um, where we fit the model in the join step um, that comes afterwards. Um, there's, there's some other stuff going on here in the semantic search model primarily, um, but for now, let's just run the workflow and we can kind of get a sense of how this looks in, in the Outer Bounds ecosystem. Okay, so to actually run it, we'll type Python and then PDF batch the name of the file. Um, since we're using um, PyPy to package, we're going to go environment equals PyPI, and then run. Um, and since we already have this PDF list file as our default, we'll go ahead and just use um, use that. Um, I, I suppose just for, for illustration purposes, maybe we can pick... Um, another paper to add to the mix. Let's see if we can find a new one. Okay, so great. So I'll say this is the time series paper and we'll add it to our list. So what we should expect now is we're going to have three for each steps. Um, obviously, the point is that you could do this with thousands of documents if you wanted. Um, and that's kind of the batch scale that we're talking about is once we get these workflows um, set up such that it makes it easy to scale from one to n. Um, then we can really increase n as much as our, our cloud will allow us. Um, so now that we've got this default set, we should be good to run without setting any more parameters. So if I go ahead and run the workflow, you can see that Metaflow has already cached the environment that we need to run in. And now we have on the playground UI. So this is the same UI that you see. Um, so if you're on the, if you're on the website, you should actually be able to go to the same link and kind of see the, the workflow that I just ran. Um, in fact, I can actually share that in the Slack channel if people want to click along, see what's happening. So if you're in the workshop doc understanding 2024 Slack channel, um, I just shared the, the link. Oh, it looks like I put in a bad, uh, a bad PDF route. Hopefully the, the other steps didn't off. Oh, yeah, okay, so we have some steps that are completing at least. Good. Um, we'll, we see that we have 40 chunks of text, and they've been embedded into a dimension of 384. So if you're familiar with a vector DB in this case, but we're kind of doing the same mathematical pattern on the same similarity search pattern. And what this means is that we have 40 vectors and they each have 384 dimensions in the vectors. And that's kind of how we're doing the search over these PDFs um, at inference time later. Um, so back to the Outer Bounds dashboard, we can see the steps kind of completing. Um, so if you want to run this yourself, it looks like taking about 30 seconds or so for a couple PDFs. Um, of course, this step is kind of uh, if you run a thousand copies of it, this step you're gonna run a thousand different tasks. So we'd have a thousand different rows appear here of this this uh, task that took about five seconds. Um, okay, so now the whole workflow is done. Um, so that's kind of the the punchline is that if you imagine these gray boxes and the extract text, you can make that essentially as as, uh, as horizontally scalable as you as you need to process all the all the documents about as fast as you can spin up Kubernetes pods. Yeah, maybe um, Eddie, um, I, I realized that we didn't say much about that compute. So if you don't mind, I mean, you can just like I click the status there on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. So um, 
the uh, of course like one of the big benefits of metaflow is that like it really like to eddie's point gives you easy access to the cloud compute so in this case i guess like what is it like we have uh, eight nodes so we have ec2 nodes that like we uh spin up automatically to kind of handle the workload and, and of course like a as you saw, I mean, like on the code side, like you don't see, you don't have to see much about the these like AWS details, but like if you kind of peek under the hood, you can see that the platform is actually connected to a Kubernetes cluster that runs on your account that like auto scales as the demand increases. And that's really the magic that allows you then to kind of like run this really, really wide for each and like a scale out to handle like any number of those documents in, in parallel. And then of course, like if you happen to be engineering minded, you can really like a dig deeper and like a see how things are being utilized. And again, I mean, there are like a, uh, like a ways how you can also then like to optimize the cost. So just a big, big question again is that like, let's say you want to build a system like this, how you can like make it operate in the most cost efficient manner. So again, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, especially in the context of what I was saying about kind of this like infinite horizontal scalability is like the, it's hard to know sometimes like what size of like what is the unit that you should be scaling horizontally um so it really helps on outer bound side and some people have kind of instrumented this on metaflow themselves as well um but it's a, a first class feature of outer bounds is tracking all of these different costs and how you're using the resources in each of those nodes um can really help you kind of understand how do you how do you batch these different workloads together you're gonna click um, the node, so yeah, because it may not be just as simple as I want one PDF per task, like I presented it here. Um, I guess, yeah, do you want to say anything about this page? Yeah, no, I mean, just saying that, like, I guess this is showing the data for yesterday. So we yesterday we spent like what less than a dollar, like for like running this one instance. Um, so, but the whole point is that, like, let's say when you start doing things at scale, I mean, like, kind of the the low level compute is pretty cheap as long as you you are not like paying any extra, like, and. As, as you may know, like when you're using many other platforms, they add a lot of margin like on top of the compute, which is why, I mean, there might be a feeling that like you can't afford doing it many, many times at scale, like around many experiments. But again, I mean, like if you just like use the low level instances, you spin them up when you need them, you spin them down when you don't need them. I mean, like really, really doesn't break the panics. Mm -hmm. I suppose actually, well, I have other deployments up here, so we may see a little bit more. Um, so here you can kind of see what it looks like when you've got a cluster that's had a little bit more use. Um, we see a bunch of different instance types with, with different cost profiles, um, but again, makes it very clear kind of what we're spending on. Um, is there anything else that you, you'd want to discuss or that you'd want to see in, in the example before we go back to the slides? Uh, no, I, I think that that looked great. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, we can we can definitely move on. I was actually like planning to also post here on Slack a, like a link and another link if you wanted to see the sentiments. Um, so yeah, posting one link there. So like uh, um, all of you on, on Slack, you can click the link again, like if you can't access the platform, just holler on Slack and we will make sure that like you can access the platform, but I mean, you can just like eyeball the results there. So they're actually quite fun. So, but uh, let me actually move back to the slide deck here. Hopefully you can see the slides. Yep, it's back. Awesome, awesome. So um, now also, um, let's say you are working in a, in a bit larger environment and it might not be only you uh, working on this application. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe you have even a team of people who work together to uh, like, let's say, like improve the results of whatever, like a customer service, like LLM based customer service agent, or like maybe you have a team of data scientists, AI engineers, like working on some fun LLM use case. So of course, then like there are these questions that like, how do you, how do you collaborate and like kind of, a, how do you iterate like without stepping on each other's uh, toes? And again, um, Metaflow has all these like collaboration features built in by default. So for instance, let's see if I can, if I can like show you, um, Kind of uh, the notebook side. So now, uh, again, like if you haven't used Metaflow before, like one important feature is that like whenever you assign uh, something to the self uh, instance variable here, it um, it actually gets persisted automatically. So actually, like let me see if I I'll just like reload my um, window here so I can show you the notebook side of things. So thanks to the fact that um, everything gets persisted. Um, you can always go back in time and like you can even like um, ask that like kind of okay so what were the results in the past or like kind of a, what were the results that my 
my colleague was producing before. So actually, like, let's see here. In this case, we can see that like Eddie was running this thing, I was running this thing, and also like Metaflow by default like keeps everybody on their own swim lane. So as they are like executing executing these runs, like you don't accidentally like kind of a like a like somehow like a fetch somebody else's results uh, by accident. So let's see here. Like, um, so I think kind of if we so we have the sentiment flow was the kind of the one that we were running before. So let's do this. Well, I guess we had yeah, we need to run this again. So let's uh, ask that like we had the review sentiment flow. And now we can ask that, okay, what was the latest execution of the review sentiment flow? And we can see that the latest send, uh, execution like has the ID 8578. And now, for instance, like for this, like we can uh, ask if you would go, let's see, like back into code here, that for instance, um, like in the in the start step, like we have this reviews that we uh, attach to this instance variable. Uh, so we can like, for instance, again, like go back here and let's look at the start step here and like ask that now we had the um, the reviews. Let's see if that works. Oh, sorry, I should have the task there. So now, for instance, like we can see exactly the all the reviews that like we were analyzing in this um, in this um, like execution. Like we can also like access like whatever else like we we store um, store like here. Like for instance, like we have uh, results. Let's take a look at the results. Like we can actually like the end step like ask results. Oh, sorry. I guess like this wasn't like, let's take a look at the, because if that didn't complete before, so then like I wouldn't have the results for that one. So if like running, you can actually like us go back in time and like I see all the past experiments as well. So let's see if we have the, not the latest one, but like one of the earlier uh, ones may have the results here. So like here, for instance, now we can see like all these like results of sentiment analysis, like from the previous execution, or like we can even like, let's see if we have the one before. And this way now, like if you want to track over time, like that, like how have the results changed, like execution after execution, like you have a perfect track record and an audit log of everything that happens. And like now again, like you can imagine that like in a, in a more like a production oriented like business critical application it's super super important that let's say like the results are not what you expect that like you can always go back in time and and see like what was going on and like kind of a, like how the how the model was behaving and of course like all the metadata about like what the model what model was used what was the prompt what were the results and like it's and like you don't have to add any boilerplate to kind of restore those things uh, when using metaflow because metaflow keeps track of everything automatically so that's that has been always super useful in, in machine learning and now like with LLMs, I mean, continues to be very valuable. Okay. Um, I, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I was kind of curious along these lines, how do you think about um, sort of how the LLM wave has, like what do you think is shifting around like tracking prompts like in this way in comparison to say traditional experiment tracking? Um, and, all, and similarly, what, what is staying the same in your view, kind of how you were just showing like the versioning provided by Metaflow and Outer Bounds is sort of common, but there's also clear differences between weights and biases dashboard and then those results you were just sure. looking at somehow. Well, yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great question. And by the way, like maybe, um, maybe you asked a kind of a question on purpose because like if you go, uh, I can just like use this shamelessly as a way to promote um, this <laughs> fireside chat that like we have actually like, Eddie, if you don't mind, like you can even like post a link to Slack so many yeah. of you may may know like a chip queen like who's uh, like a very well known character like in the space of ml and ai and like she will be also like talking exactly about the topic the shift from uh, ml to, to ai i believe that will take place in a few weeks and like so you will hear much more like kind of many more insights about that uh, topic uh, in a few weeks but i can just say here that well i mean starting from from something that uh, absolutely like remains the same is really this loop here which is that uh, data science and machine learning has been always a very iterative endeavor. It has been always about like being able to um, test different approaches. It might be different model families uh, about different data sets, uh, about different hyperparameters. And 
and like kind of being able to kind of do that effectively and like that's a big difference also to software engineering like that tends to be a bit more well defined that like you know when when something works and like you don't have to iterate your way through it so these like iterations remain really important of course the nature of the iterations have changed in a sense that like whereas in the like with traditional ml which of course hasn't gone anywhere oftentimes like you could like analyze the results in a, in a much more quantitative fashion and like maybe if you are training your custom models they're like a things the model metrics that you want to keep an eye on uh, for instance like in these type of document understanding use cases in a sense there isn't like kind of a, in some sense like a like any any data science taking place per se because we are not changing the models of course we could be fine-tuning the models but like in these cases what we have been demonstrating we are not even fine-tuning the models so it tends to be much more qualitative in nature so instead of like just having a beautiful dashboard about let's say looking at the convergence of the model or like rmsc or like some other model metric like the, the evaluation is is getting getting like kind of a bit more I guess like a gnarly because like it's 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 much harder to come up with at least universal metrics. The metrics tend to be much more use case specific. Right. And, uh, right. So, right. Yeah. yeah, that definitely checks out. It seems very um, like multi-objective kind of these massive grids of uh, searching across all the different benchmarks somehow. It seems quite a bit yeah. different from like you yeah. said, just looking at looking at a convergence curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also like like I, I don't know like about all of you like uh, following along uh, this workshop. But um, but I mean, now we have also like way more people doing these things. So, uh, mm -hmm. especially like a hardcore kind of a machine learning, like used to be something that like maybe you needed a PhD to kind of really like kind of a develop new model architectures and stuff like that. But of course, I mean, it is a fact that like anybody could be developing models like this. All the Python code that we have been showing, I mean, there's really no rocket science. I mean, the the sentiment review is less than hundred lines of really straightforward Python code. Um, so it is absolutely magical. And I, I think that that's one of the most exciting things that like the, the the sentiment example that we have been looking at here, this stuff, I mean, this would have absolutely been a topic of a PhD. I mean, just like five years ago. And now like it takes a few lines of code and like especially the fact that it works so well. I mean, it, it is it is mind boggling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, anyways, in the interest of time, um, I guess, uh, well, we, we covered this slide idea, right? Yeah, we we really we went over the content essentially. Um, maybe I'll just give the yeah, thirty maybe. second highlight. Maybe you did that. Um, and we can move on. Um, so the other tab of that uh, front end application that we looked at for the PDF app, um, there's another route. This route we see here, the upload URL um, list file. Um, this is the same thing that we saw when we manually did it from the command line with Metaflow code. Um, when we kind of changed around that um, PDF list that TXT file. Um, this is also kind of hooked up from the front end application. Do you, have, do you want to share your screen? Is it easier to show? Ah, yes, yes, much better. Okay, okay. Um, there we go. And I'll go back here briefly. Um, so if you recall, we, we kind of ran this PDF rag indexing workflow. Uh, it was with this command. Um, and it kind of did the same kind of PDF chunking routine and then indexing as well as fitting the model for search. Um, this is also linked up to the front end application. Um, so you can use the front end applications uh, batch route, this one here, um, and kind of construct a list of papers. Um, and then as we saw in the diagram here, um, what it's doing is it's gonna, from this S API server, it's going to actually run the same Metaflow workflow that we just ran locally. Um, so you could do, do stuff like queue up a bunch of models that have different configurations of the PDF data, kind of index to, to index on. Um, and the one of the interesting parts about this technically is that we're using a new Metaflow feature called the runner API. Um, so if you're familiar with Metaflow, and especially if you haven't heard of the runner API, um, definitely worth checking out. Um, super handy in these cases, like running Metaflow workflows from Jupyter Notebooks, from um, GitHub Actions, or any other CI CD provider. Um, but essentially, what we're doing is we're also using it on the Fast API server to run the same workflow that we just did from the command line. Um, so, very flexible and kind of demonstrates how easy Metaflow makes it to plug into external systems and kind of make sure the machine learning parts of what you're doing are connected to the other value producing parts of your products and applications. Um, so that, that was kind of the main part there. And I see we have about 20 
five minutes left, so maybe we should keep moving. Um, yeah. Do you, you want to go back to the slides? Yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah. And um, so now, basically, um, if you have been following, like we are at the point, uh, like where we are able to, um, I'm like sharing my screen. Hopefully, you can see. Like we are basically able to uh, run these. Um, LLMs at scale, and like we like Eddie was demonstrating, we can even have a UI like where we can see the results, like we can hit the endpoints. Of course, I mean again, now we could like coming up with the exact evaluation strategies is use case dependent. That's something that like you would layer on top of this foundation. Also, thanks to the fact that like we can use these containers like NIM that deploy in your environment, like we can evaluate everything securely. And also like thanks to the fact that we don't have to pay per token, uh, like we can like just keep hitting the LLMs as, as much as we want. So basically like we are at the point where we can like really, really quickly iterate on ideas, iterate on the models, there's different models, there's different data sets, there's different prompts, and even like kind of a use the kind of, let's say Metaflow's collaboration features to kind of like keep everybody on their swim lane, like look at the results in notebooks, all, all that good stuff, so that works. Now, the, the next interesting part here is that, um, of course, like at the end of the day, like we don't want to run the production system, not even the workflows on our local workstation, like not on our notebook, not on any single server, because like one of the key features of, of being anything close to production is that it needs to be highly available. Under no circumstances, we want the production system go down. So again, like imagine that, let's say like we are building this document understanding system for like, let's say loan applications at the bank. And like every time somebody submits a new mortgage application, it has to go through LLM and then it has to spit out whatever, like, I don't know, like some kind of like a know, like a fraud score or like kind of a credit score or whatever it might be. And this system, of course, has to be highly reliable. So it can't be running on anybody's laptop. It can't be running on like any single server, but it has to be in some kind of like really, really robust uh, production environment. And hence like this question that, okay, how do we like make this uh, reliable enough? And then like before, like we even um, like get to the point of uh, like having one production version, there's the question that like, well, I mean, how would we even like deploy this as an experiment so that like it runs outside, outside our laptops. And now um, again, like leveraging like the features that Metaflow has always had available. So there's this uh, section in the documentation, you can find production deployments. Anyway, long, long story short here is that we want to uh, be able to deploy these workflows in an environment that's highly available, that's also scalable, like you can trigger these flows depending on different conditions, like you can monitor and operate. And uh, on that note, uh, Metaflow integrates with number of different production workflow orchestrators. So building a workflow orchestrator is actually like a pretty, pretty demanding task. Uh, like we used to be at Netflix, uh, like where people have spent like tens of uh, person years, like building these systems. And there are a couple of open source project and managed services like AWS Step functions that do this really well. But um, it's pretty like when we are operating in this Kubernetes native environment, like we can leverage this uh, open source project called Argo Workflows that Metaflow integrates natively with. And I can show how that works. So um, actually like if like I can just um, show my VS code here again, I mean, this is the very same Metaflow flow that we had before. And like I know that like since this is by the way like running on my um, my outer bounds workstation, so it runs in the cloud. But um, since I know that like you don't have access to the workstation like during this work workshop, so we have to cover that later. Show how it works here on the command line. So I can simply take the flow.py here, and I will execute flow Argo workflows create. And what happens in this case is that Metaflow looks at that Python code that you just wrote and automatically converts that um, like into a format understood by Argo workflows and deploys it in the cloud. Now in this case, like running on our AWS account. And in this case, like we got some like helpful output, for instance, like it notifies us that like we didn't uh, set up any, any like a triggering like for this workflow. So we have to go to the UI if we want to run it. So now I can actually like go to the UI, I can go to the deployments tab and I can see that now like we have this um, uh, like a long string here, like that ends with the review sentiment flow um, that is uh, ready for execution. And now actually like here in the UI, and I believe that like all of you who have access to the UI, you can see this, that like we have here the trigger and like I can just go here, like we can see like how many things we want to run in parallel and like I can now submit the new execution here. And now that the key thing about this execution is that uh, again, I mean, it doesn't run on my laptop, it doesn't run, um, run on like any single server, but it's like a run as like a highly available 
uh, Argo workflows deployment that is like has multiple replicas and so forth. So let's say now, if we had, if we actually like could add, actually like maybe I'll just like show it. So we could do this. Uh, we could like go here in the code, and uh, here like for instance we can do schedule daily equals true. Oh, sorry, true. We could do this, and now let's deploy it again. Oh, of course, we need to import the schedule. I no wonder if I have a more modern editor, but this works on the command line just fine. So let's try that. So now we are deploying a new version like that uh, should run on a daily basis because we added that uh, schedule equals true. So let's see here when it deploys, we should be able to see it. So it's kind of here. So it's, it says that now this uh, triggers automatically. And like if we go back to the UI, let's um, refresh this view. Like we should be able to see here that the, now the latest deployment runs at midnight every day, Tassie, like even this like a chronic expression here. So this way now, like we have deployed the actual like a sentiment review uh, flow to run automatically every midnight, like totally independent from anything that uh, that like we do. Now, um, the key thing going back to what we had here in the slide, how do we deploy an experiment is the fact that actually, like if you look carefully, like you can see that like we have this uh, thing called a branch, uh, which means that like we created a branch deployment. When I ran the Argo workflows create by myself, by default, it created a branch like for me automatically. So if any other like a few folks uh, who may be uh, coding along here, like if you want to run the same command, you can you can run the Argo workflow create. Like what we should see happening is that like, and maybe Eddie, like if you happen to have like everything set up, you can even like do Argo workflows create. And then like we see that like we get another branch of this deployment. And now it might be so that let's say Eddie has different prompts. Maybe he has different LLM than I do. And like he will get his own deployment that will run in parallel in night as an isolated deployment. Or another like a fun thing that I could do here is that I should be able to create something like a branch, like a, let's say like a new model. And now you could imagine that like maybe I've been, um, instead of using the Llama 3.7b, maybe I'm using the ADB or like maybe I'm testing Nixtrol or something like that. So now I'm uh, deploying a new branch. And again, like when we go to the UI here, like now we see that like we have two branches. So we have this branch new model and then we have the original branch. And again, I mean, this would run totally independently now at midnight every day uh, as a separate separate deployment. And now you can imagine that like you could have any number of these things like running concurrently, like representing different different prompts and like whatever you may have. And like, again, I mean, like Metaflow keeps track of everything. So then afterwards you can go and compare the results and like measure the accuracy of different approaches and so forth. So that's, that's very, very useful. Now the um, one, like while well, we covered the Argo workflows, uh, and yes, so I'm like good, good reminder that I should have mentioned that the key thing that like makes this possible here, like if you look at the code, is this uh, at project decorator, and like it is thanks to the at project decorator that like we basically group number of deployments under that one umbrella uh, project, like which is the sentiment analysis, and and that's why like that's how we can like maintain multiple deployments. Now, one thing that I wanted to highlight here as well, you can actually like go to our blog and like maybe some of you like may um, notice and like just like scrolling down here, you can take a look at the article by yourself if you're interested. Is that of course like in a, in a more like a production ready setup, we wouldn't want to make these production deployments, um, sorry, production deployments uh, on our laptop or like on any kind of workstation, but rather what we would like to do is to make the deploy deployments through some kind of a CI CD system. So for instance, so that like you can, and like any developer can do the development, all the experimentation locally, then they would be making a pull request um, to let's say like if you are using GitHub, like the normal like GitHub um, uh, pull request. And then like the interesting thing is that like that pull request like through GitHub actions can automatically trigger, let's say some kind of a testing. Let's say you have a corpus of test documents that you want to run. So we can run like through the like automatic evaluation as a part of the, um, the CI CD pipeline. And then like based on the results, there can be even a human in the loop step, like where somebody eyeballs the results and like maybe approves the changes, approves the new prompts, and then like it clicks approve. 
after like which the GitHub action like would deploy the new version in production instead of you doing it manually. And here again, like kind of a, one of the key things, if you look at this picture, is that like typically then like you would separate a different uh, separate staging environment that like you dedicated for experimentation like from the production environment, like and the production like always goes through the CI CD system, right? So if you are interested uh, in like setting up the like a GitOps like for your like a LLM use cases, definitely take a look at this uh, blog article that we have in our blog that was released a couple of months back. Now um, let's move on, like in the interest of time. So we did the workflows create part. So now like getting to the kind of the, the last part here that um, um, so here, like now we are able to kind of like deploy these workflows. Um, so all good and fine. But there are like a couple of uh, things uh, now remaining, like if we really, really like wanted to make this something that's kind of like an enterprise grade, like that, like you would actually like run in a, in a real environment. Again, just like a highlight couple of things and then like Eddie will uh, show a demo. So here, like for instance, uh, the, the big thing that like we will want to show you is that like how you actually get this uh, data sets, not from a CSV file, but from an actual uh, data warehouse. So we can show how to do that with Snowflake. Obviously, like some of you may be using Databricks, maybe your data may be in S3 or like in, in, in some other like databases or data warehouses. Now, like another like a big thing, uh, and like unfortunately, like we don't have time to go too much into details here, uh, is that like you really want to set up separate environments, um, what we call perimeters, like for uh, production and staging again. And like, um, so that for instance, like it might be so that like you want to do the testing only with the test data set that's only available in staging and then like the production has access to the production. Also like it might be that maybe production has more um, like LLM bandwidth available. Like if you want to again, like uh, optimize the costs and like then you can configure it so that let's say in the, um, in the kind of the, the 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 staging environment in the testing environment like you have like a fewer resources available if you want or like conversely you can do more on the production side also there may be security reasons that you may want to um uh like carefully like uh, manage the containers that like you can use in in production and so forth so like all, all kinds of like best practices that like you have you have like kind of a, when you want to move the production but one of the key things really here is the kind of a question of the data access so at this point, Eddie, um, do you want to talk about this slide? And uh, then like maybe you can show the demo. Yeah, I'll say a few words here and then um, I'll do the screen share afterwards. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically this last um, small demo that we want to show um, is two workflows, which are these blue kind of circles, are these Metaflow graphs that we've been discussing and showing in code. Um, the first one is going to read in data in this kind of for each pattern is what's symbolized by these uh, three blue circles stacked on each other. Um, it's called, each of these is going to read in um, different chunks of data from a Snowflake database table. And then there, we're going to do some processing, essentially summarizing um, various HTML pages that are related to each row in that database table. And we're going to add a new column to the table um, is kind of the idea. But the contents of that, those columns that are getting added um, are going to be the result of a, a kind of an LLM summarization task, if you will. Um, the second workflow that we're going to run after this um, ingestion is, is called the transform data in this um, in this slide. Um, the, the biggest thing that's going on here is we're using Metaflow's integration with the DBT project, um, which handles transformations in a variety of data warehouses, including Snowflake. Um, so we kind of have this end-to-end -end pipeline set up. Um, it's going to be highly scalable, um, and we're going to be able to kind of use tools that the data engineering community is familiar with, like Snowflake and DBT. Um, any any other questions or thoughts before we dive into the example? Yeah, let's let's do it. So we have time for questions in the end as well. Let's do it. Yeah, I'll try and go quick here. Um, okay, so I'll just share the full screen there. Okay, so. I'm going to go over here where I have the first Snowflake example. Um, so the Snowflake flows, um, there's one of these sections for each of the flows that we just looked at in the um, slide. So the first one, again, is going to be pulling in the data from a Snowflake table, doing some summarization with the LLM, and writing that table back to Snowflake. And then the second flow is going to be doing the DBT processes. 
Um, before I run this stuff, let's actually go into our Snowflake account and see what is actually going to happen. So this free company data sets outputs is what we're going to create. So I'm going to drop it so we can see that that comes back um, when we run the actual workflow. Oops, I didn't drop the table. There we go. Um, the source data set for all of this is coming from People Data Labs. So we access this uh, Snowflake database from their Snowflake marketplace, um, where a bunch of different companies and organizations can share databases with you. Um, so we have kind of imported this free company data set from People Data Labs. This is going to be that first blue arrow coming into the workflow. And then we're going to write um, the free company data set outputs as the output. So, okay, so let's what, is the, what, what is the data set about? Yeah, great question. Just skipping the most important part, right? Um, let's take a look at the data preview here. So each row is corresponding to a business. So we have a bunch of different metadata about these businesses, like the country they're in, when they were founded, LinkedIn URL, locality, so on and so forth. The thing that we're the most interested in is this website link, where we're going to be, for each of the rows that we process, we're going to be um, kind of fetching the contents of the HTML page, that's the landing page of that business. And then we're going to be trying to summarize the landing page with an LLM, as well as use it to classify whether or not this business is likely using AI in their current processes based on the content of that, um, that landing page. Um, so you could imagine maybe this would be useful for sort of doing a, a rough kind of estimation of who, who in this data set you might want to target for some sales um, project or some, some go-to-market project. Um, but that, this is the data table, and then we'll get a table that has most of this information plus a few extra columns as the output. Nice. OK, so now back to the flow. Um, so the command is going to have the same structure as we saw before. Um, the only thing that we need to be aware of here that's kind of non-standard or not always used with Metaflow is this environment equals PyPy. Um, because we have some extra dependencies like the snowflake connector the pi arrow dependencies things like this um, but again all we need to do is add this as well as let's declare those in our code and metaflow takes care of the rest let's go ahead and run um, we can see the environments are already cached like before and now we're going to have uh, this market intel ingestion workflow which that name is coming from this flow file in the zero one snowflake this workflow here. Um, so the interesting parts are happening in the process function. So for each of the different kind of chunks of data that we're breaking up, we are going to be doing this summarize and classify function, which unfortunately we don't have time to go into today. That's in this utils.py file. Um, but this is where we kind of take the, that website URL and turn it into a summarization, as well as the classification task mentioned earlier. Maybe, Eddie, like one, one kind of like a bit boring but important detail is like how you actually connect to Snowflake. So. Yeah, great question. Um, so in this case, we're using a Metaflow feature that's called at secrets. So like everything else we've discussed, it's, it's the decorators. Um, the at secrets decorator is connected to the cloud provider that's actually running these compute tasks. Um, so it's a lot of jargon. All it means is basically we have a secure way that the cloud providers suggest um, to kind of populate these tasks runtimes with the environment variables they need to connect to things like Snowflake, connect to things like OpenAI is also being used for this task. So we have kind of two separate credentials that we need, um, and we want to put those into the task securely at runtime. Um, that, that's what's going on here with secrets at a high level. Um, is there anything? more detail or any other yeah, change no, you'd want to add? No, I mean, although I mean, that is exactly the type of thing that like, again, I mean, emphasizing the production grade part that now imagine that it's not only uh, one secret that you went, want to access, but it might be so that like you have a different secret corresponding to your like staging or testing data set and you have a exactly. different secret for the production. And then they have to map to the corresponding environments because of course, like you don't want the production secrets to leak to somebody doing testing and so forth. So being able to kind of keep everybody like on their own swim lanes and like keep those secrets separated. Um, of course, like a super, super important, like when you are doing these things like in a, in a real, like a business environment. Yeah, yeah, very good point. 
Um, so you can see we're almost getting done here. I can go check in the dashboard. And I guess like Eddie, maybe one one question like about the code. So I guess like you, I, I saw that you were just using the, the typical Snowflake client here. So um, do, do um, you like run the query or? Yeah, actually. So this is using, <clears throat> this is a good example in this function here. Um, so there's a kind of a little client wrapper um, that we built that wraps around the Snowflake connector is what's being used to do all the heavy lifting. Um, Snowflake's built a very nice implementation for kind of moving the data from Snowflake tables into PyArrow tables or Pandas data frames in memory. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just kind of piggybacking on that with this little wrapper that kind of makes some light assumptions about which essentially which key value pairs are defined in these secrets. And then once that's the case, it makes it quite easy to just kind of open up a little context manager and execute whatever queries we need or put files into Snowflake um, with commands that look like typical Metaflow commands. Um, but, but you can also just use, if you prefer to just use the Snowflake connector directly, There's no, Metaflow doesn't have any limitations like this on the Python code that runs here. Um, so this is done. Um, I guess one thing that we can check um, just to make sure it's working as expected is if we refresh on our data sets page in Snowflake, we now should see this output table. So let's go ahead and look at this. And same as before, we can do the data preview. And now the new stuff that we should see is, is one, it's filtered. Um, but now we also kind of have this return code. So right here we see this website's no good. There's a couple here that are good. Um, for those ones that we actually were able to get a response code, here's the summary from the LLMs, as well as kind of some LLM statistics, more about its completion data, the summarization, and then our classification. So we see probably not too many using AI so far in this table, but here we have one kind of makes sense to talking about VFX um, and then just more stats about kind of the LLM generation task. So um, Eddie, just to, yeah, just to summarize, so I, I guess the, and like, can you show the kind of the run, like, um, I guess like on the UI? Yeah, so this is the Metaflow run that produced nice. that table. And I, I guess like in this case, I mean, there were like so many things that were going on, so you kind of, uh, you were able to establish the secure connection to Snowflake. You got the rows, then like you went through everything. Then you actually like crawled their websites on the fly, right. and then like a fed the inputs so, or like the fed the uh, the, the website content. Uh, now I guess like in this case you were using the OpenAI API, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, actually, no. This this one was using the the Nim container. Oh, nice. Um, okay. So I guess for I don't know one one data point that was I found kind of interesting is I was seeing roughly the same time spans for these tasks where that kind of pro heavy lifting was happening. So you can kind of get a pretty good sense of like compare the amount of token costs on OpenAI to just how long does it cost to have the G GPU server running? It looks like 30, about 30 seconds in this case to process all of these in parallel. Nice, um, nice. And then like you got the classification uh, like and, and you push it back to Snowflake to kind of refine right. the table. Nice, right. Nice. Um, and then the next part that's wired up with the Argo workflows is to kind of do more dbt transformations on that table we just looked at. Um, but I think that's a, a story for another time, it seems. Um, yeah, so maybe two, like, two yeah. minutes. All, almost at the time. So maybe I'll just like show the few slides that I had left, um, basically okay. just to summarize. So um, hopefully you can you can see my screen. So like we saw the snowflake. But I mean, just to summarize, like also like the Eddie's end-to-end -end example. So, but I mean, this this kind of the same template, same pattern, of course, like applies to many other production use cases, where of course, like all all starts with this question that like, how do you access data securely? Eddie was demonstrating like getting data from Snowflake. Again, of course, could be Databricks, could be S3, could be anything else as well there. Again, I mean, like one, one like underappreciated, but important thing is that like, how do you actually do it securely so that even you can separate the different like governance boundaries, production staging and so forth. And uh, I guess like one thing again, like that we didn't have time to go into detail, but it's the functionality where like you are able to uh, trigger the workflow automatically whenever new data appears, which is of course super important in production that you are not just like a like a sitting there like a waiting and doing nothing like when new data would be available, but immediately when data is available, you can you can start like running these workflows. And um, again, like we can use tools like DBT to process the data, of course, like a scale out the processing thanks to Kubernetes, like a really cheap EC2 instances. That's nice or like other clouds as well. 
and and like then the, of course the kind of really the core the kind of the meat of the workshop is that then we are able once we have the data once we have the input tokens available we can hit the uh hit the llms as as hard as we want like thanks to um, things like nim and like a, finally like we had a couple of examples like where we could observe these results like through metaflows built-in visualizations through the cards and now i mean like like i, I wish like this was all there is to it but i mean of course now the fact is that in, in realistic environment like you may have any number of of these workflows running in parallel when you have different versions like you have a production version then like you have a somebody like who came up with new ideas let's like try some other way of like pre-processing let's try some other data source and hence like you need to be able to develop and deploy this iteratively like side by side which is where the project comes in and then like the, the part that we also briefly touched is this question that like as now you have multiple people doing the development, working in their own branches. Like, how do you follow the software engineering best practices so that like people are not stepping on each other's toes? Like, you can establish like a code review patterns and so forth, where you can really like follow all the GitOps best practices and like use CI/CD systems like uh, GitHub Actions and so forth. So now, like putting all these things together, like you are actually starting to have a pretty production grade. Uh, uh, LLM powered document understanding system. So there are a good number of moving parts, but I mean, like, thanks to all, all the abstractions, let's say, afforded by Metaflow, and of course, like these amazing open source models and then so forth, like, it is it is actually like mind blowing how how it is possible to kind of do the thing that, like, let's say, Eddie was just showing, like, crawl the web, uh, classify the results, and like, kind of that just takes a few minutes. So I mean, yeah, I mean, like, we will be busy, like, for the next, I don't know, decade, like, kind of automating everything in the world. So uh, on, on that note, since we are like pretty much at the time here, um, uh, if you are interested in starting like a building this like production grade MLAI systems, of course, like a, a LLMs document understanding in particular, uh, like uh, some easy starting points here, like Metaflow documentation, docsmetaflow.org. We have many fun examples in our blog. So you can go to autobounds.com slash blog. Again, like there is the Slack channel. Um, uh, available. I mean, the reason like why we wanted to do on Slack so that it wouldn't disappear after like we end this call in a few minutes. So you can still uh, join the Slack, ask any questions on the Ask Metaflow channel. There are over 4,000 people there like uh, doing all kinds of fun things. So like we would love to see you there as well. And then of course, like uh, with the all the, the outer bounds goodness that we were demoing today, if this is something that might be interesting to do instead of like going to, with the open source, choose your own adventure path. Um, like it's very easy to get started. It doesn't cost anything, it takes about 15 minutes. You just go to outerbounds.com, get started, and like you click the button and like off you go. So um, so yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it for today. I know that like there are other sessions starting and like many of you may be heading out to other places already. So I don't know if we have much time for questions. Uh, but again, like there's the Slack channel, like very much would encourage you to join the Slack, um, ask anything there, and uh, we are happy to continue the discussion on that side. Is there anything else, Eddie, that you would like to add? I think that covers it. Yeah, looking forward to hearing your questions and thoughts on the, the content. Awesome, awesome. Well, anyway, thank you so much for attending this session. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully see you on Slack. <laughs>